Welcome to Round Glass Stories. Take your time and find a relaxed position, whether it be lying down or sitting in your most comfortable chair. As you gently close your eyes, feel your mind begin to ease with any stress slowly falling off you, like rain on lush jungle leaves. As the mist of your mind dissipates, breathe slowly, deeply, as the soft sound of my voice carries you away into the wondrous worlds of imagination. The Hero with a Fairy Godmother by Carolyn Sherwin Bailey The prince who was the hero of one of your favorite Once Upon a Time stories was quite sure to have had a fairy godmother to watch over his ways and help in bringing his adventures to success. But Hercules, the great of old Greece than whom we have never known a greater hero, had two fairy godmothers. They were not known by exactly the name in the days when the myths were made, but there were two very powerful goddesses who presided over Hercules' destiny. And the odd thing about it was that no one knew which of these was the more important. Hercules began life just like any other baby, except that his father was the mighty Jupiter, a fact which made everyone expect a great deal of him. And just as used to happen in your old fairy tales, he had enemies because of his noble birth. One of these was the goddess Juno. Hercules lay in his cradle one day before he was able to walk even, and suddenly he saw something that would have frightened anyone much older than he. On each side of his cradle there appeared the green hissing head of a huge serpent their poisonous fangs thrust out to sting this child of gods to death. Hercules' attendants ran in terror, not daring to give fight to the vipers, but he reached out his tiny hands, gripped the serpent in each by the throat, and strangled them. People began to look at Hercules in wonder after that. They watched him grow up, just like any other boy, except that his limbs were stronger and his muscles harder than those of the average boy of Greece. There were still those who admired him and those who hated him, knowing that he was, really, the son of a god. So his enemies put Hercules in charge of a kind of tutor named Eurystheus, who was under orders to give him the most impossible task to try and perform. The lad will fail and then we shall be rid of him, the goddess Juno, who particularly disliked Hercules, said. Hercules began life in a part of Greece that was known as the Valley of Nemea. It was the place of olive orchards and fruit trees and fields of grain. But the terror of the place was the Nemean lion who lived close by in the fastness of the hills. There had never been known so such a huge lion with such wide, bloodthirsty jaws. Eurystheus ordered Hercules to bring him the tawny hide of this monster. How shall I slay the Nemean lion? Hercules asked. With your arrows and your club, Eurystheus replied carelessly, but he knew that no arrows in all Greece could pierce the lion's skin, and that Hercules' club, made of a stout young tree, would also be powerless against the beast. Hercules will never return, the people of the valley said to each other as they watched the young hero start out boldly towards the hills. But he returned the next day, as fresh and untroubled as when he had started, with the hide of the Nemean lion slung over his shoulder. Are yours magic arrows? And is your club charmed as well? The youths who were Hercules' friends asked, crowding around him. I killed the lion with my hands alone, Hercules explained to them. Eurystheus, listening on the edge of the crowd, frowned at these words. I must plan greater labor for him, he thought. There was a rich and beautiful city of Greece named Argos, but a fearful monster called the Hydra infested a swamp just outside it, and one never knew when it would descend upon the well that supplied the people with pure water. 
It had nine heads and one of these was immortal. So the rumor went. Go to Argos and kill the Hydra, Eurystheus commanded Hercules. Hercules was ready to dare this adventure. He started out again with no other arms than he had carried before, and when he came to the well of Argos, which kept the country from drought, he found the Hydra stationed there. Going up to it, Hercules struck off one of its heads with his club. What was his surprise to see two heads grow in the place of this one? It was going to be a task to destroy this creature, Hercules understood, as he laid on with his club against the menacing and increasing heads, hitting right and left with no time between his telling blows. He struck off all of the Hydra's heads at last except the Undyne one. Finally, Hercules thought of a plan for destroying this. He wrenched it off with his mighty hands and buried it deeply underneath a rock. Hercules shall be put to a task he will not like so well as encountering wild beasts, Eurystheus decided then. He shall clean the Augean stables. We will see if a son of the gods has the will to accomplish that labor. This was indeed a labor with very little of the spirit of adventure in it. Old King Aegeus of Elis in Greece had a herd of 3,000 cattle and their stalls in as many stables had not been cleaned for 30 years. The cattle, all of them, blooded stock, were dying off because they were not properly cared for, because all felt the work of cleaning the stables to be too menial for them. Hercules had no such thought as this, however. He was ready to attempt the labor. His only idea was how to accomplish it, and thoroughly. At last, he had a very novel idea. There were scarcely any of the lesser gods of outdoors who had not, by this time, felt the strength of Hercules. There had been the river god who took delight in leading the waters of the streams over the banks and inundating the farms in the spring when the fields had just been planted. Hercules had wrestled with the river god and had broken off one of his horns, on account of which he had to keep the streams between their banks. Hercules made up his mind that he would take advantage of his power over the river god and his present need. So what did Hercules do but lead the courses of the two streams, the Alpheus and the Peneus, right through the Augean stables, cleansing them thoroughly? When he had finished this labor, the result was so fine that he had quite as much reason to be proud of it as he had had over his other prowess. It was as splendid to use one's strength in cleaning as in any other way. Hercules discovered. He went on from one adventure to another with the years, always successful, although everyone prophesied that someday his strength would fail and he would have to give up. Eurystheus wanted a new yoke of oxen, and none would do except those who lived in the land of the setting sun, in the western part of Greece, and were guarded by a giant who had three bodies. Hercules set out for the place and when he had reached it, discovered that not only the giant, but a huge dog that had two heads guarded the oxen. Hercules killed the giant and his dog and drove the oxen home to Eurystheus. Victor over wild beasts and giants and able to accomplish any work which he attempted. What labor was there left for the son of Mount Olympus? Eurystheus knew. He sent Hercules on what seemed indeed a wild goose search. He commanded him to bring back to Greece the golden apples of the Hesperides without telling him where they were to be found. They were very plump and beautiful apples made altogether of solid gold. It is said that they were the first apples the world had ever known. However, that may be the Greeks wanted them very much. Juno had received them for a wedding present from the goddess of Earth and had hung some on a golden tree in the fair garden of the daughters of Hesperus, who kept a dragon to guard them. It would have been a task to pick them even if one had known where to go for them. Hercules started out, though, without route or chart, and it was the most difficult of all his adventures. He met Antaeus, a son of the Earth, who was a mighty giant and a wrestler. Hercules encountered this son of the earth and threw him countless times, but each time the giant rose from the ground with renewed strength. It was like magic. 
But Hercules found out at last the secret of Antaeus' strength, as you also will in the next story, and did battle with him. Then on went Hercules, for the earth could no longer stop him, and after a while he found himself at Mount Atlas in Africa. The bent old giant Atlas stood at the top of this, holding the sky on his shoulders. He was as ancient as the mountain itself, and doomed by the gods to stand there through the seasons, and never go home to the Garden of Hesperides, where his daughters live. If you will but bring me the golden apples of the Hesperides, old Atlas, I will take your place on the mountaintop for a space, Hercules said to the giant. The sky is heavier than you can imagine, my son, Atlas replied. I doubt if you can bear it. Let me but try, Hercules urged him. So Atlas shifted the burden of the heavens from his shoulders to those of Hercules, and the hero held them securely. When Atlas returned, his arms full of the precious golden balls, Hercules still held the sky as if he scarcely felt its weight. Atlas wanted to have him hold it always, but Hercules was of no mind to do that. He gave his load back to Atlas and took the apples of the Hesperides home to Greece. Hercules had conquered the earth even in this last adventure, and it seemed as if there was no great deed left for this hero. But he continued using his mighty strength, even to descending to Pluto's realm of darkness and bringing back the heroic Theseus who was a prisoner there. At last, even his enemies on Mount Olympus were forced to grant him a place of honor in their midst, and Jupiter wrapped him in a cloud and sent a four-horse chariot to bring him home along the road of stars. When Hercules reached the Olympian heights, it is said that old Atlas bent still lower with the weight on his shoulders, for this hero had added new strength to the heavens. But how about those two goddesses, you ask, who preside like fairy godmothers over the destiny of Hercules? The ancients asked the same question, and Hercules answered it just before Jupiter called him away from Greece. One of these goddesses was named Virtue, and the other, Pleasure. But it was the first whom Hercules followed all his life. And it was by living in Virtue that he never lost to any task or challenge posed to him. <laughs>